Good morning. Please rise. You. you may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you all today? Oh, ay, ay, ay. Quiet, apparently. All right, that's fine. It's Christmas. I was telling the first service, my wife showed me something this week, that there's, there's two stages of Christmas preparations. There's the first stage where I've got plenty of time, and then there's the second stage where it's, oh, no, right? I'm not going to ask what stage you guys are in, but there's always that stage. My family, historically, we did not do our shopping until Christmas Eve. Every year, we would drive to Des Moines on Christmas Eve to do our Christmas shopping. When I was a kid, I loved it. Now, as an adult, I think, shoot me in the head right now, please. I, <laughs> I have every intention of never going to the store in the whole month of December, and yet every December, we end up going for something that we, had to, that we forgot or whatever it was. We were... Well, adopt a family. You guys, we did adopt a family this year where we adopted two families. We had over $1,000 given to us, which was just amazing as a church. You guys did so great. Thank you so much for that. But part of what we do then, because we don't give out cash, okay, to people. So we went and we went shopping for them, went clothes shopping, went grocery shopping for them. And who, okay, if you're going to go shopping, it's better to spend someone else's money on someone else, all right? That was a lot of fun, okay? I enjoyed that. But still, Walmart, the week, right, a week before Christmas, trying to get three carts through the shopping area. And then I joked with Rachel, said, we're going to go through the self-checkout, right? Oh, man, we needed that marriage class this morning because the look that I got from her was pleasant. <laughs> self-checkout was not an option, all right? But it was, anyway, I don't know how I got off on that, but it was, it was a good year, you guys, man. You really did just, it was just amazing. We had one family come on Friday to pick up and the mom walked around the corner and saw the pile, and she immediately tears, just immediately tears, guys. And that was, that was love that you guys showed them. And they were just, they were blown away by it. And it, it was just amazing to be part of that. So thank you guys for your generosity. Continue to pray for these families. The last family is coming today to pick up their items, and we have a whole gob to give them. And so we just, we just appreciate you guys so much for your generosity to them. Thank you for doing that. A couple things there in your bulletins, you want to pull this stuff out. There's a few things. Our Christmas Eve services this year was coming up on Thursday, of course, Christmas Eve, at 6.30. I know the newsletter said 5.30, okay? We changed it to 6.30. We thought more people would be able to get off of work and be able to be there. We're going to be at the Civic Center at 6.30, so we want you guys to plan on that. Because of the new DHM, we'll be able to seat up to 280 people. So there's going to be plenty of space there. We want you guys to come, bring your friends, bring your family. We have invitations on the tables in each lobby that you can hand out. Um, there's on our Facebook page, it's on our website, you can direct people to it. But 6.30 is our Christmas Eve service. And we want you guys to come if you can. We understand if you can't, but if you can, please come to that. We'd love you to be part of that. But I am looking for some help on that afternoon at 2 o'clock on Thursday. We're planning on being down there to try to set up a bunch of chairs, get the stage set up, and get some things like that for the service. So if you can come on Thursday at 2, 
we would appreciate the help on that. Just come down. It shouldn't take us long, but setting up a bunch of chairs, scattering things out, um, it's, it's going to take a little bit of time, but it shouldn't be too long. I'm thinking about an hour tops to be able to finish all that stuff, depending on how many people show up. So if you can come down and just help us with that, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, so the help would be the help would be loved and and needed. To be perfectly honest with you, so if you can come down. We we just again would appreciate that very much. The Presbyterian Church here in town asked us to put in our bulletin about their Christmas meals they're delivering this year. Uh, there's a phone number there you can call if you want some of the Christmas meals that they're offering. Uh, so just call them if you want to. And then Zach, while I'm talking about this last one, if you want to come on up here, um, Zach's got something he wants to mention for the deacons. Um, but do be in prayer for our Awana kids. We kind of had what seemed like a bit of a breakthrough this year with one, of our, with one of our kids, and I can't mention a lot, but we want you guys to be in prayer for our Awana kids. And so do pray for them. We had a great Christmas party this year. Um, it was a closing party, and we enjoyed that immensely. Uh, but be in prayer. God's working. God's doing some great things in our Awana kids, and I just want you guys to be aware of those things, that God is still doing what God does best, which is change lives. And so do be in prayer for our Awana kids as well. Zach? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Merry Christmas to all of you. If I don't uh, see you before uh, Christmas, um, Christmas season is the time for giving and blessing others. And we've been blessed this year by an excellent staff of team members here at the church who have mentored, and guided us, prayed for us, walked along beside of us, uh, taught us uh, many things, and provided a great example. So this Christmas season, uh, the deacons, we've um, decided to take a collection uh, to bless back our staff members of the church, which would be um, our pastors, our church secretary, and uh, also uh, Barb, who works uh, in the nursery. And the deacons will take care of uh, getting uh, that offering to them. But uh, if you would like to contribute to that, please mark your um, offering envelope, uh, Christmas bonus or just bonus, and uh, we'll make sure it gets to the right place or put it in the memo on your check. So thank you very much, and also thank you for the Thanksgiving offering again. That was a tremendous amount of money, over $10,000 given, half of which went to our missionaries of the church who needed it uh, so desperately, and uh, thank you so much for that, and then also to uh, help us pay off our uh, building loan that we have, which is well under $30,000 at this point uh, on a $300,000 project. So uh, very good job, and uh, thank you for blessing the church, and um, that's all I have. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. We're going to need that later up here. So, to Zach's point there on the, on the building, if you look on the inside of your bulletin, if you want to pull that open, there's a little box on the bottom right corner. It talks about our budget. You can see the building fund there and the loan balance of $34,000. Well, we have $9,000 to transfer into that this week. So we're going to be below $26,000 by the time that's transferred. And the building project itself was over three hundred. but then when you added the sprinkler system that was thrown in there, surprise, it ended up being $426,000. So essentially, in two years' time, we've paid off $400,000 as a church with only twenty six dollars left which is just incredible, guys. It's just incredible. I mean, it's... I, I just can't hardly believe it. This is just amazing. So, guys, thank you so much. It really is. Yep, it really is. So thank you so much for your generosity. I mean, you guys, the way you bless with the Thanksgiving offering, we know our missionaries, I believe those checks were sent out this week to our missionaries. Um, they're going to be excited to receive those checks just here when they need them around Christmas, end of year. It's going to be good for them. Uh, there's just so much that we have done that God has just worked through you guys. Thank you so much for your generosity. I, and I'm just blown away by y'all. You guys, you guys are great, to be honest with you. You really are. Um, the ministry of the church, you know, we do need to continue the ministry of the church. So if you want to give an offering, we're not handing out plates like we normally do. But what we do is we have an offering plate at the back of the room. There's one on, in each lobby. And then there's two plates up front. You can give that way. Or you can go online. I know a lot of you are trying, choosing to do that. You can go online to our website, uh, stpaulgrace.org. And from there, it's yeah, S-T-P-A-U-L, stpaulgrace.org. And then there's a giving tab. And you can set up your payments there if you want to, one time or recurring, whatever you want. But that's an easy way to do it as well. And you can do that. So if you guys want to continue, you know, please do continue giving to the ministry of the church. Financially, we are doing well, um, but there's things that we want to continue doing, things we want to kind of branch out a little bit and just reach out even more during this time as well. People need the message of hope. 
Uh, and so we want to be able to give that message to them. And so your support helps us be able to do that well. And I do thank you for your support. A couple of phrases here, uh, things to talk about is, with the new DHM, of course, being able to have 280 people come to our Christmas Eve service, potentially, now I don't know how many is going to come. We had 180 last year, somewhere between 180 and 190 in here last year, and we're hoping for at least that again this year. Um, but that's just a praise to be able to do this in one service, combined together, worshiping, remembering the birth of our Christ. That's going to be great for us on Thursday. Um, so that's a praise and a prayer request. Um, but the other praise I had that many of you don't know about or aren't aware of, we have a lot of people right now, uh, Janice Riesland, Tested positive for COVID, but she's showing no symptoms at all. Uh, Kelvin's, uh, Kelvin Smith, his dad, was in the hospital um, with some COVID-related things, but his mom, meanwhile, tested COVID as well, and she also was showing no symptoms. So we have people that we're aware of that, that did get COVID. They were tested positive, but yet they showed no symptoms at all, and they're, they're people who, frankly, have health concerns, and yet God is choosing to protect them, and we thank, we thank God for that. But there are people who do need prayer still. Um, I found out this morning about there's a lady who comes to our Bible study, uh, the women's Bible study on Thursday morning, and her mom just this week went to the hospital with a, with a urinary tract infection, and while there they also detected, they also discovered that she has COVID and pneumonia on top of the urinary tract infection. So if we could pray for her, that would be great. Um, her name is Irene. Pray for Irene. Uh, her family asked for prayers for that, so if we could pray for Irene, that would be awesome. I know she needs prayers. Um, continue to pray for Junior Riesland. He is losing weight. Um, his teeth situation is still not very good. Um, he's, just, he's just not doing well. He's going downhill physically, it seems. And so continue to pray for Junior. Um, he's trying to, his spirits are still up. He's still just a happy guy. He's amazing to be around. Um, but Junior needs our prayers as well. And there are some other people who have, have had losses in there. You can see the, the prayer request in your bulletin. Just keep those in your prayers. Brian and Chris Sanders, um, there's some, some missionaries of ours. They're right now kind of waiting for some different things that's happening. And so they're They've got some expenses both overseas and on the U.S. side, so keep them in prayer as they're trying to manage these expenses and manage them well. Um, so lift them up as well if you would mind doing that. The Christmas season is going to be hard for people. This is going to be a weird year, and I was thinking about that just this week, reading some news and some statistics that they were showing. Um, you have all these states where the governors are saying, you know, don't get together for Christmas, stay apart, stay by yourself as much as you can. That's going to be very hard for people. People's emotions right now are going to be kind of all over the board. We need you guys, if you can, just think of your neighbors, think of your friends. Try to reach out to people. Try to, try to show them a little bit of love here, because there's going to be a lot of lonely people right now, where their Christmas just looks weird, it looks different. And so they're going to they're gonna need your prayer, they're going to need your support. And so if God leads you in that direction as much as you can this week, try to encourage people. Because it is just a weird year, and they're going to need some encouragement. So I just want to pray for those people, some of these requests. And so if you, let's, let's take this to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we thank you. We thank you, one, that you care for us, that you know what we're going through. There are days, I admit, that I want to be able to see you, to be able to have you tangibly beside me where I can talk to you, where I can see your facial expressions, where I can just hear that instant response back. God, I, I'd love to have that type of relationship with you, and yet it's not time for that. It's coming, but it's not here yet. Um, Lord, right now we're trying to muddle through this mess on this earth, and we need your help. We need your support. We, need your, we just need your presence. God, we have decisions that we're trying to make um, Decisions that sometimes seem almost impossible. Seems like we don't have the strength to do what, what it requires from us. And, and yet, Lord, you promised to give us strength. We're going to need your strength. We ask you to help us as we try to minister to people this, even this coming week. We're reaching out of our comfort zone, stretching ourselves a little bit. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be able to do that and do that well. I thank you for how you provided for our church financially. I thank you for how you provided for our church just with um, keeping people healthy. Even though they test positive, they're still not showing any symptoms, and that's great. But Lord, there are some who are struggling. Um, Father, for them, I pray that you would provide healing. Be with their families right now, as I know they're stressed and trying to, trying to help as much as they can, but at the same time knowing they can't actually be at the hospital to see their loved ones and, and just the stress from that. Lord, I pray that you would work in those situations. We pray that you'd be with Irene. Lord, please heal her. Kelvin's dad as well. We're grateful that he's home. He's home from the hospital. That's great. But Lord, he continues to need your strength and your healing. And for Junior, we ask that they be able to get his teeth straightened out so he actually can get some teeth and be able to eat something rather than just a liquid diet. Father, provide for him too. Lord, be with our Christmas Eve service this week. We want it to honor you. It's going to be different. It's going to be a different location. It's not going to look the same. Um, but Lord, we're, we can worship you anywhere. 
And I pray this Christmas Eve service this week would be a time of worship for you, to you. Lord, help us, even today. Today we're going to celebrate a baptism and how fun that's going to be. Just, Lord, I pray that what we do today would bring glory to you and that we would walk home just feeling that we are connected as a family, connect with you as well in our time of worship today. In Jesus' name, amen. I asked my kids um, what it was they liked about church, and that's one of the things that, that you don't like, but it was their wanna lesson. It was, what do you like about church? What do you like the most? What do you like the least? And, of course, the answer that you get, which you expect as the pastor and yet you hate it, is the, they, they hated the teaching time the most because it never ended, right? It went on and on and on. And it's their own dad who just talks forever and ever and ever. So I acknowledge that tension because today it's Christmas week. Y'all have things you want to do. Y'all have places you want to be. And for some of you, being here is the last thing on your wish list, okay? I get that. I understand that. Some of you guys are watching online. You sit there and think, and maybe you're watching because, you know, you feel that tension to be in church and you think, well, that's the right thing to do. And, and yet there's all these other things going through your mind, all these other places you need to be, things you need to do. And, and this tension of trying to have a worshipful attitude the week before Christmas and all that stuff, it's just hard, isn't it? When I was a kid, I, there were times I just hated, I loved Sunday school, but I hated church. You'd sit there and the preacher would talk about something that made no sense to me. And he he goes on and and it's like he's trying to use every minute out of the clock and you stare at the clock and you just watch it. And a watch clock never turns. It's just, I swear it doesn't. And I'm rambling on again. You guys think, okay, Pastor, get to the message already so we can go home. All right. I'm just understanding that today it's going to be a little bit hard. I'm going to try to keep it interesting for you. We're going to try to keep it short. We have a lot of things to do. I know, but we're going to try to keep it interesting today as we talk about this idea of an everlasting father. Now, doesn't that just get your adrenaline pumped? Just in those words, everlasting father. All right, maybe not. Well, i got to be honest with you. Uh, when I read the passage the first time, it really didn't get my adrenaline going either. What does that even mean, everlasting father? And so today, we're going to talk about that idea of everlasting father because I think it means something well, I know it means something, but it means something to me now that is different than what it's ever meant before. And I think you're going to enjoy this as we talk about everlasting Father. This is sermon number three out of Isaiah 9, verse 6. Yeah, what kind of pastor gets three sermons out of one verse? Well, you're, you're, I'm gifted, okay? My... <laughs> don't think about that, all right? Just don't think about that. Gifted, which, which way? He's special. Yeah, all right. Isaiah 9, verse 6. There are four names mentioned. In this sermon series, we're talking about this. In Isaiah 9, 6, we read of a prophecy regarding the coming Messiah. A prophecy which includes four names he would be called. And this Christmas season, we're going to look at each of the names from this passage and learn how who he is results in specific blessings for us. The names are on this here. I know it's kind of hard to see with the trees, and now we have a little baptistry tank and all that stuff, but I've put them on the screen for you. Isaiah 9, 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Four names out of one passage relating to a prophecy regarding the coming Messiah. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. This is, going to be, this is just an interesting thing to sit and think about. And we've talked about in the last couple of weeks. We talk about the first two names. We talk about Wonderful Counselor. Now, here's a God that we can't even imagine just who he is. We can't fathom God's eternality. We can't can't grasp all of these things about our God. He's wonderful beyond belief. It's, It's secret, really. It's hidden from us. The power of our God, who is also our counselor. Not as a counselor we would go to where they have no clue what we're going through and they're trying the best they can to give us advice. No, this is a counselor who actually created us, who knows everything we're going through, and he's saying, just come to me. Come to me, come to me. I've got everything you need. Just come to me. That is my counselor. He's a mighty God who is, he's a warrior. He's a hero, as we talked about last week. He's a God who calls men up. He's not a passive Christ. He's a strong Christ. He's a strong person, not a weakling. He's mighty, and he's God, the creator of all things. Today, we're going to talk about this idea of everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. A little review, we've got to remember that names in the Bible are important, very important, because these names indicate something about the person named. We can learn something just by their name alone. We talked about things like this. We talked about two names. We're going to remind ourselves of these again. Adam, 
Adam out of the earth was formed. Adam literally means earth. From the earth he was formed. Abraham, the father of many nations. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 5, God changes Abram's name. His name was Abram. And he said, you will now be called Abraham, the father of many nations. And he was the father of many nations. The names of Christ are what I'm going to continue the most important names in the Bible. And the names of Christ indicate certain characteristics about him, certain characteristics that result in blessings for us. Warren Wiersbe, in his book, The Names of Jesus, he says this. He said, each name that he bears indicates some blessing that he shares that we can appropriate, and we can appropriate these blessings by faith. So there is names of Christ that we have. These names indicate something about Christ, indicate a blessing that we will receive through faith in Jesus Christ. And today is one of those blessings, this whole idea of everlasting father. Today is the third name in Isaiah 9-6, the third name we're going to look at, this name of everlasting father. And there's some things that, these, that this name specifically means for us, some things that I've never really thought about. Because I read the verse, and I think about Wonderful Counselor, and that, of course, kind of makes sense to me a little bit. And the mighty God just resonates within me as a guy, and just love that fact. But everlasting Father, what does that even mean? To me, it meant nothing more than, well, yeah, he's God who lives forever. But there's more to it than that. And there's some things that I never really thought about until I prepared this message that I, I just, I loved the way it came out, how God prepared this for me. And hopefully you're going to like this as well. Let's break this thing down. Everlasting. It means lasting forever or for a very long time. If I say the word everlasting gobstopper, does that ring a bell within any of your minds? Right? <laughs> everlasting gobstopper. Who doesn't love that movie? Uh, don't answer that question, all right? But everlasting gobstopper, did they, did they last everlasting? No, they didn't. They were short term. I mean, they lasted for a long time, but they weren't truly everlasting. Whereas my God is everlasting. We talked about this. He's an everlasting God. We just got done talking about Revelation and, and how in the eternity to come, we're going to be with him, praising him, worshiping him, but also learning and exploring. And every day is going to be a new day. And it's going to be kind of exciting for us as we experience all these new things. And, and I, I use the word day, understanding that in heaven there is no night or day. But there's always going to be something new to do. And that's going to be fun, and we can kind of wrestle with that a little bit. We can almost envision that, but what fries my mind is, is thinking about what happened before all of this happened. What did God do prior to this? Is this the only earth that he has created full of humans, or has he done this before us? I don't know. It's fun to think about. It's just my opinion, right? The Bible doesn't speak to any of that stuff. But I sit here and think, I can't imagine that a God who's lived forever was just twiddling his thumbs one day in eternity, and then, hey, this sounds like a fun idea, and he made this earth, and someday this earth is going to be destroyed, and, and he's going to, we're going to go into eternity with him, and yet he's not going to do anything else because he's a big God. This whole idea of before the beginning just blows my mind. What was God doing before the beginning? Because in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created. What was he doing before that? Beats me. But my everlasting God was there, and he was doing something. But he's everlasting, lasting forever. He's also a father. I think about that as a father. And of course, you think of this warm figure, so to speak, who's there to, you know, to, to run to. He's there to give you support, stuff like that. But the word father here in the Hebrew, it actually means one that originates or institutes. Okay, One that originates or institutes. We know people, and I know you guys know all this, such as you know, Mr. Knight, who was the father of the modern-day black powder rifle, the inline rifle. The night rifles. Anybody know the night rifles? Anybody here familiar with those things? Seriously? Nobody is? This guy created the inline muzzle loader. Those things were awesome. I figured all you guys as Christians would know this. Wow. What do they teach you guys in Sunday school? All right, never mind. So he lived in Centerville, Iowa. His factory was there out of Centerville, Iowa, which is just 13 miles from where I grew up. But that was the first original inline muzzle loader. He was the father of those things. We call him the father of inline rifles. Why? Because he was the first one who invented it. He was the originator of these things. Father meaning originator. That's who Christ is. He is the originator of these things. All right? One that originates or institutes. So everlasting, one that's lived forever, father, originator. And calling Jesus Christ the everlasting father, the prophet was saying he is the originator of that which is everlasting, he is the author of the eternal, and that's important. That last phrase, he is the author of the eternal, that has huge implications for us. 
We're going to come back to this in a second. We're going to touch on it again. But remember that phrase. He is the author of the eternal. That's who Jesus is. The originator of all things, the author of the eternal. So, let's think about this idea of Christ being everlasting. He existed before. He existed before there was a beginning. He existed before. And and I said it this way. He existed before there was even a before. Right? Because there was no time. Christ existed before time. So there was literally nothing, and Christ existed before that. So when we sit and think about Christ existed before, what did he exist before? Well, he existed before everything. He existed. He's everlasting. And again, that fries our minds. It short-circuits it. We're shifting without a clutch, and smoke's coming out of our ears trying to process through this whole thing, right? Christ existing before. And what did that even look like before? How empty was it? Where was it? You know, we talk about how empty was it. Well, what does it even look like? What did it look like? In the beginning, God created. What did he do before he created? Beats me, but I know he existed before he created. He existed before. That just fries me just a little bit to try to process it. I can't wrap my mind around it. The psalmist writes this. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Before all this came into existence, you were God. Jeremiah says the Lord is a true God. He's a living God and the everlasting King. He is everlasting, the everlasting Father. This is exactly our God that we have. W.E. Vine says this, He inhabits and possesses eternity. And this is important for us to think about, how Christ inhabits and possesses eternity. All right, that's very important. And we'll tie that into this context. Remember, you cannot give what you don't have, Right? We hear that all the time. You can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. This biblical truth that he he inhabits and possesses eternity is very important for us because since he created everything, including time, he can give us time. What we call eternal life is nothing more than eternal time. Eternal time in his presence. You can't get what you don't have. He possesses eternity. He inhabits eternity. He is the author of the eternal He can give us eternal because he has it. He created it. He is beyond all these things that we have. And because he has eternal time, he can give us eternal time. And that's his promise to us. John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life or time, if you want to put that in parentheses, eternal time. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus promises to give us only what he has to give. But he has everything to give. And what what he has to give is this idea of eternal time. This everlasting life he promises us because he inhabits and possesses it himself. 1 John 2.25, this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. We have a promise by God of eternal life. And we know he can give it because he himself possesses it. That is his promise to us. This is one of those blessings that comes by believing in an everlasting God. Just one blessing that we have. But this idea, this eternal life idea is, yes, it's something we cannot grasp. But when I sit and think about the fact that in reality God created all of this, then it's no wonder God can promise it to me as well. Because he has it himself to give. He is everlasting. Because he's everlasting, I will be able to be with him for eternity in an everlasting way as well. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. John 6, 47. Whoever believes has eternal life. His promise to us is eternal time. And he can give it because he is everlasting himself. Eternal himself, he confers, he confers eternal life on those who believe in him. W. E. Vine says this. Eternal himself, he confers eternal life on those who believe in him because he has it himself. All right, so Christ is everlasting. Christ is the father of all things. As I mentioned earlier, he's the originator of all things. From him, everything comes. He is the original of everything. He is the firstborn, as Paul writes, of all creation. He is the originator of all things. All things are made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 3, Colossians 1, 16. For by him all things are created. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is the originator. 
the everlasting originator. All things came from him. Now, as much as we say we understand this, frankly, it's hard to grasp. We will never fully grasp this. We'll never fully get, get that concept in our heads of as much as we could try to define it, but this, this thought that everything came from Christ, including time itself, and our finite minds, God created, but God himself is infinite. But the Bible says we're never fully going to grasp all the implications of this. It's, it's not going to happen. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says this, He made everything appropriate in its time. He also prepared eternity within them, placed eternity within them, yet no person can fully comprehend what God is doing from beginning to end. We can't grasp this. We can't get it. There's no way for us to know and understand God's plans. We just cannot. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My way is not your ways. There's no way for us to fully grasp what it means that our everlasting God created this world as the originator of this world. Yet through faith we try. And that's all we can do really is try. But think about this for a minute. All right, think about this. There's a so what here I want to tie into this. There's a little application here. We know it's everlasting. We know it's the originator. But what does this mean for us? How does this matter to me? Does this even matter to me? Does this change the way I live? And yes, it should change the way you live. Let's roll through this. Scripture teaches around 2,000 years ago, a timeless God invaded time. A timeless God invaded time. Luke chapter 2. Verse 11, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. A timeless God invaded time. What does that mean exactly? And the best illustration I can come up with, and every illustration breaks down, but here's the best illustration I could come up with. My, my kids, they say I'm special. They're right, I am. But when I was a kid, and maybe you guys are the same, did you ever have these little worlds that you built? As a guy, you know, back when it was politically correct to do this, I had army men, right? You guys ever have an army man? You created these huge stages of wars and stuff like that. Some people had Legos, right? We had Legos, and you have your, your the, remember the little people? Remember those, the, what, the little people that were just about two inches tall, and they had little farms and everything set up? My brother was into, um, was into farm construction equipment. He loved that, so we had a, a couple of dealerships near us, and he had this whole set of Ertl equipment, right? He had a piece of plywood set up with farms built on it. We create these little worlds, don't we? Somewhere within us is this desire to create. And so as a kid, I don't want to admit to doing that as an adult, but as a kid, we'd create these little worlds. So imagine God, as a God, creating a world. Now as a kid, I always thought, wouldn't it be fun for me to be able to shrink down and climb into that tractor and drive it? Or even better, because I'm a boy, climb into that tank and just destroy everything? Yeah! That'd be awesome, right? Because, of course, I get to drive the tank. That's what the guy does when you create the world. You get to drive the tank. You get to destroy everything up. That's what happens. I was reminded, of course, of that Calvin and Hobbes comic. Hopefully you guys like Calvin and Hobbes, right? I understand not knowing about night rifles, but Calvin and Hobbes, surely you guys are on board with this one. Best comic strip ever? i got so much to do. All right. <laughs> got to regroup. All right. From 1985 to 1995, the theologian by the name of Bill Watterson wrote Calvin and Hobbes. He's not a theologian. He's a great comic guy, but Calvin and Hobbes is the best one ever. They showed a Sunday comic one time of Calvin creating this little world of snowmen, four-inch tall snowmen, right? And he's got this whole world full of snowmen. And so you see in one of the panels, you see Calvin taking a step back and looking at this world full of snowmen, and then Calvin gets this evil expression on his face. And the very last panel is Calvin in his imagination becoming a dinosaur, destroying all the whole city of people rampaging through the streets and everybody dying, and it was just, right, that's Calvin. It's hilarious to think about, okay? And as a kid, I created these worlds just to go in and do something nasty to it, right? To go in and be the victorious conqueror. God created a world, and God came into this world, but not to do something nasty to this world, but to actually come in and do a relationship with us. It was possible for this child that was born to say, look what I made. I made all of these things down here. And all of these things are hurting. So I'm going to become one of those things now. So that, like in the comic strip where Calvin in his imagination, his tagger was real and talking to him and walking with him. So that someday, me, 
who has nothing in common with God could actually walk with him someday. He entered this world that he created in his imagination, as great as it was. He entered this tinker toy world that he created. He became one of us. He invaded time. And he did this for us. All of this he did, and my clicker died, for us. When Jesus Christ was born at Bethlehem, time and eternity met in a person, a gift that was given. Imagine, if you will, of course, in one of those army scenes that I pictured for you, I've got all my toys everywhere, and I've got my, my platoon of men around the corner of the piano, and I've got my other guys over there on the couch, and then you've got your, your, uh, your airplanes flying down low, and you know where they're going to come from. So imagine entering that world, and you know where everything is at that point. You know what's coming, because you created all of that. So there you are as a foot soldier, so to speak, just a normal person, which Jesus Christ came as a normal person, and all these people are talking about the problems they're having, and Christ says, look, I know what's coming. I know what's around the piano. I know what's hiding on the couch. I know where the guys are coming from. What a gift that is to have that king walk beside us. The creator meets the created. Eternity and time come together, and the rules changed. The world shifted. Matter and antimatter came together, and I'm telling you, everything changed at that moment on, and he did it for us. He recognized what we could not recognize. He knew what was coming as a little plastic foot soldiers, what was coming. And he came down there and he's walking alongside us, helping us through it, even now with his presence. But he physically was here for a amount of time. And he did it for us. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Those who have no clue what's happening. We understand that God created this. We understand that, that there's a heaven and a hell and all that stuff, and we're here in this life, but God, we don't know what we're doing. And God knows what we're doing because he created this. He knows everything. He is above this, looking down on us. Just like my brother with his four-by-eight sheet of plywood in the middle of our bedroom with all, the, with all the farm equipment spread out everywhere. He knew what every piece was doing. He knew what was happening. He knew what tractor was going to break down that day. He knew what disc was going to blow a wheel and needed to be fixed. He knew that because he did it, right? It was one of those things. He created this farm. Now, God doesn't come and do evil things to us. He says, James, very clear that God does not do evil, but God is there to help us through it. He came to seek and save those who needed help. He, a timeless God, came and met us living in time. And when he died at Calvary, time and eternity met in a price that was paid that price meant the demands of God's holy law and opened the way for sinners to be forgiven and share in eternity. Because as I said, God shrunk himself down. As Philippians 2 says, he limited himself to become man. He shrunk himself down to our size to walk with us in this world that he created so that someday, someday when this world gets taken apart, dismantled, and he puts the pieces away, we at that point will get to walk alongside him. We become the stuffed animal that comes to life, walking beside our creator how wonderful that's going to be i just can't imagine and i know that analogy breaks down but that's the best thing i could do the best way i could come up with this my relationship with god and what it's like for him to enter this world because he gives me eternal time eternal life i no longer have to fear the weapons of time there's nothing i have to be afraid of anymore this is my hope this christmas in year 2020 this is my hope warren wearsby suggests three things that we have to fear because of time Three things that, frankly, we no longer have to fear because of God giving us eternal time. Those three things are, first, delay. We fear delay, don't we? It's the year 2020. In March, COVID came through. Shut churches down for months. Some churches are still closed. Grace was shut down for a couple months. That was hard for us. As a church, things are going like crazy at the beginning of the year. From January, February, March, averaging 124 people, getting closer to our vision of 2022, of 240 people by the end of 2022. We thought, God, you're doing a great thing here. This is fantastic. Things are growing. And then this hit. And all of a sudden, what do we feel like? We feel like somebody put the brakes on, don't we? And I know in your life, many of you feel the same thing. It feels like somebody put the brakes on. And God, how are we going to get done what we're supposed to get done? What do we do here? For some of us, it's later in life that we feel this calling by God to actually do something. Or in later in life that we feel like God can actually use us to do something. Maybe we stay at our same job, but we feel finally have the courage to share the gospel for the first time. Finally have the courage to man up and, and serve God for the first time in a ministry. Where the, man, God, I'm, I'm 30 years old or 40 or 50 and I'm just now doing this. God, I've wasted all these years. Here's the thing. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. 
which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Because I have a God who created all of this. He's the originator of all of this. He knows what he has for me. And this delay by COVID is not going to stop that. I don't have to fear delay because I have a God who originated everything, including time. I no longer have to fear time. I don't have to fear delay. I don't have to fear uh, Philippians 1 6. Forgot this one's in there. I stuck it in last night. I am sure of this. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion of the day of Jesus Christ. God is going to do what God's going to do through us. Now, yes, we have a point where we have to be obedient to Him. I get that. I understand that. But God's got works prepared for us, and He's going to complete them. I don't have to fear this whole delay. I don't have to fear the decay that comes. We look in our lives around us, and we drive, even drive down the highway, you'll see farms that have been vacant for a long time, and the houses are frankly just falling apart. Empty homesteads that are just rotting. Decay happens because of time. Over time, decay happens, right? That's one of the enemies that time brings to us. Time reveals decay. We sit there and we look at our, at our own physical bodies, right? And we're just like, man, we're just falling apart. I remember Pastor Cash, when I was a kid, and I think I've told this story before, forgive me, I'm going to tell it again. When I was at summer camp, and Pastor Cash, there in his young 30s, he mentions, he said, hey guys, as you get older, you're, you're going to fall apart too. And he was, he was a very large guy, all right? Very large. He loved church potlucks, and it was obvious, okay? And uh, he said, you know, when I was your age, talking to those high schoolers, he said, I was 18, 19 years old. He said, I played racquetball all the time. I was in shape. I lifted weights. I did the whole nine yards. He said, I was, I was in shape. He said, but now look at me. I'm a physical wreck. And at that point, I spoke up and said, amen, preacher. <laughs> Not a good time to be affirming to him. He stopped right in the middle and said, shut up, bear, jerk. <laughs> that moment, the spirit left the campsite. But that's all right. It was still fun. And I deserve everything I get back from you guys, and you guys give it to me in spades. So yeah, what goes around comes around, all right. Decay, though, the whole concept of decay, things falling apart. I don't have to fear that because, frankly, this world isn't my home anyway. God's given me eternal life, everlasting time. I don't have to fear this. This is just a blip on the horizon. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. That's eternity. For the things that are seen are transient ever-changing, ever-in-flux, moving all the time. Ah, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I don't have to fear decay. I don't have to be scared of what happens here on this earth because someday there's going to be way much more than this for a much longer time. And so because of that, I don't have to fear death either. You ever think about time for the idea that it's nothing more than a measuring tool? We as people want to measure everything. We measure our weight. We measure our height. We measure our anniversaries. We measure our birthdays. We measure everything. We measure our foot size. Alex is constantly, Dad, I'm almost taller than you. I'm almost taller than you. He's going to pass me. He grew like eight inches in six months this last year, the doctor said, from between appointments. It was ridiculous, all right? But he's going to, we measure everything. Time is another measuring tool, all right? And as much as you want to, I've done this before. I'll show up at a, at a meeting sometimes with a tape measure. What's a tape measure for? I want to see how long this meeting is going to last, right? And you got to use the right measuring tool for it. Can you guys give me something with that? Come on. That was a good one. Boo, thank you. Well, you're better than the first service. First service people just, Keith rolled his head, or rolled his head, rolled his eyes and shook his head. And that was about the only response I got first service. So thank you for giving me something, people. All right. Come up with good jokes. Come up with good jokes and we'll give you something. Pastor Cash right now is laughing as he thinks about what I'm getting in return for what I did to him. All right, guys, we tend to measure everything, don't we? And we use death as the final measurement so often. The world around us, for sure, uses death as the final measurement. That's the end of the yardstick for our lives. The truth is, because of my God who gives everlasting time, I don't have to fear death. It's not the end of anything for me. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, O oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The sting of death is gone. The consequence of death is gone. The finality of death is gone. Because unto us a child is born. What a great promise that is. So what do we do with these truths? Well, a couple of responses we can do here. A couple of responses. One, we can proclaim them. 
What do we do with the truth that we have an eternal God who gives us eternal life because he himself possesses eternity? We can proclaim this. We go back to the Christmas story. Luke chapter 2 is one of the best tellings of the Christmas story, one we read every Christmas in our family. And Luke chapter 2, the shepherds, after hearing the message from the angels, what the shepherds do, they went with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. The King James says they made known abroad the saying that had been told them concerning this child. They proclaimed it. They were not shy. They proclaimed it. So we can proclaim this message or we can reject this message. There's a warning for that in the book of John. Jesus himself talks about the danger of rejecting the message of the truth the truth that unto us a child is born. It says this in John chapter 3, God did not send a son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. There's a condemnation for those who reject him. And in John 12, verse 48, read this, The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes on him who sent me has eternal life and shall not come to judgment, but is passed from death into life. With the implication there, of course, that if you do not believe, you will come into judgment. Jesus says in John 12, he says, the words that I have spoken will judge if you reject. Are we going to proclaim or are we going to reject? Are we going to proclaim the truth of this son of God who became a man so that men could become sons of God? Of God. That is ultimately the truth of God's word. That is the Christmas message that we rejoice in this week. So as weird as this week is, as different as the celebrations are going to be, we have a hope that this year, this year is not the last year that we'll get to celebrate anything with our family and friends who are believers in Christ. Because even as they're the last year on earth, I'm going to see them again in eternity, and there's going to be a big party up there as well. I don't have to grieve. I don't have to miss out on anything because God enabled me to become his son. And someday's going to be a big party and I'm looking forward to that moment. God, I thank you so much for your word. And Lord, we have these two responses. We have the response of, of proclaiming the truth of this or rejecting the truth of this. God, we are asking that you would help us to have the faith that we need to proclaim. Because it's one thing to believe, it's another thing to actually act upon it. And Lord, we, while believing your word is a lot different than than actually doing something with it, Lord, I pray that we do something with it this Christmas season. Lord, I'm praying that you would help us to remember the gift that you gave us. This gift of eternal life. That was encapsulated just in your son, illustrated just in the birth of your son. Eternity coming and meeting time, invading time. We thank you for these gifts, Father for everlasting life promised from your Son, who is our everlasting Father, the originator of eternity. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. That was exciting. (laughs) Well, it's an exciting day today. Today is a day that we get to celebrate a baptism, and that is always a wonderful experience to get to witness and to be a part of and celebrate with. And so, especially for you guys joining us online, you also are going to be witnessing, and we're so excited to have you. If you can, leave a comment in the comment section. Let us know you're here. Just type in Merry Christmas, hello, splish splash, you know, anything (laughs) that would be appropriate for the baptism. That would be great. And so, anyways, for baptism, we always let uh, the person being baptized choose a song for us to sing and celebrate with. And so, Sammy chose Give Me Faith. So, please rise as we all sing this song today um, for Sammy's baptism as she is growing in her faith as well. Okay?
Sammy and her mom Shannon come on up here at this point. A couple weeks ago, I received a call from Shannon saying Sammy's been talking about getting baptized and she'd really like to get baptized before Christmas. Come on, don't be shy, Sammy. It's all right. We're not going to hurt you. You want to stand with her or no? You're good? It's whatever you want to do. You don't want to be up here either, do you? All right. I get that. Okay. Lights are bright, aren't they? Yeah, they are. 
So last Sunday, the deacons met with Sammy, and part of what grace does, it's in our constitution, our bylaws, is that whenever someone wants to get baptized, we sit with them first um, just to talk to them about their, their testimony of salvation. Uh, because one of the things the scripture teaches is that baptism, baptism has nothing to do with salvation. Baptism in and of itself does not save us. What baptism is, is it's an illustration of what Christ has done for us. How he was buried and then he was resurrected on the third day for us. And this baptism is a symbol of that. Of us dying and being buried and then coming up out of the water is a symbol of his resurrection. It's not actually salvation. Baptism doesn't save you. And we talked to Sammy about that and she understands that. Um, but so we talked about Sammy. So we asked her, we said, Sammy, when it comes to your salvation, what is it that gets you into heaven? What is it that we need to do for eternal life? And you remember how you answered us as deacons? What was it? When we asked you, how is it that you go into heaven? How is it you get eternal life? What, did, what was your answer to that? You remember what it was? Believing. That's right. And believing in whom? Who do you believe in? God. That's correct. And what was it? And so, Sammy, for us, what was it that God did for you that allows your sins to be forgiven? What was it he did for you? He came to this earth and he did what? Saved us. He saved us by, by how? What was the action that he did for us? Died for our sins. That's right. He died for our sins. That's exactly right. And so the Bible says, we look at a couple of verses today, John 6, 47 being one of them, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Believe for everlasting life. Acts 16, 31, believe for the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. John 5, 24, believe, believe, hear my words and believe on him who sent me has eternal life. And Sammy, through her, through her faith in Christ then, knows she has everlasting life. But she, as a step of obedience in Christ, wanted to be baptized as a symbol of that. And so today, we get to celebrate that with you. Are you excited? Are you a little bit excited? Okay. You seem excited. We warned her there's no jumping in the tank, all right? There's no splashing in the tank. It's going to be, it's going to be kind of fun. I hope it's warm enough for you, okay? The guys are trying to put warm water in there. So we're going to have your mom help you here in just a minute. And I'm going to take my jacket off because it's dry clean only, and that would be bad. And I got hooked up. I knew I would, and I did. There we go. Got my sleeve up in there. This is always awkward. So, Sammy, what we're going to do is we're going to put a towel around here, around the front, so you can step on it when you get out, okay? And we're going to have you step in, and then your mom's going to have some towels here to dry you off as soon as you step out. And it's going to be kind of fun, okay? So are you ready for this? All right, so we're going to jump on in. Oh, that's pretty nice. Goodness, that's much better than the last time. Are you okay? Is it too hot? <laughs> Crikey. Yeah, that is a little bit warm. We need a bucket of cold water. Somebody want to get some cold water in here? You guys are killing. So we're going to stall for a minute. For those who are online, um, <laughs> do we have any song suggestions or anything here? They did, uh, they did really well. Um, normally these things need heaters. The last baptism we did was less than warm, and they almost screamed when they got in because of the cold. We've got to figure out a way to balance this out. All right, Sammy, we're literally not trying to cook you, okay? This is not, <laughs> it's not one of those. Um, I'm sorry? Is it because of her shirt, the Nebraska Cornhuskers? Um, you know how I feel about the Cornhuskers, okay? They did win yesterday against a team that they should have won against, all right? So... Congratulations to the Cornhuskers for winning an easy game. Iowa did not play. Their game was canceled. So it's all right. And the basketball team lost to the number one person in the state, so I don't know how they're ranked right now, but they're doing pretty good basketball-wise. All right, we have an empty bucket. That should help. We're getting closer. <laughs> getting closer, all right. Water fountains. For those who are guests today, welcome, welcome to Grace, where we <laughs> really don't know what we're doing. Um, there we go. <laughs> we'll remember next time. Well, they really thought the water would cool off because they figured that I would preach for a couple hours. Um, so I cut my sermon time in half, and the water's still not very cold yet. But that is too warm to stand in, that's for sure. Yeah, that would hurt you, I think, just a little bit. So uh, let's see. We're going to stall here. What do we need to talk about? Um, normally, if I was in Awana, I would be asking kids, all right, we're going to pick the favorite breakfast that was served today. Who had the best breakfast? And we'd go around the room and see who had the best breakfast. I don't want to do that with you guys. I'm sorry? Oh, that's a good call. We can stall with that one. This last week, uh, the food pantry received a whole bunch of donations from Omaha, including several hams, and I think there's even a whole turkey back here that weighs around 24 pounds, okay? So if anybody wants 
some of those hams, or there is that one turkey, or there's some vegetables, and there's some fruits, there's all sorts of things. After the service, go back here to the kitchen, all right, and there's some stuff downstairs in the freezer as well. I think we were given some hamburger rolls. What are we doing? Yeah, it's still, still very warm. All right. We had some three-pound uh, three rolls of hamburger that was given to us. We've got some chicken fajita meat that was given to us. And I think there's also some uh, drumsticks ready to be fried that was given to us as well. So if you guys want some meat, and I know you're Christians, you eat meat. This is what we do. I had a friend tell me if God didn't want us to eat meat, he wouldn't have made animals out of meat. So that's, this is true. If he didn't want us to eat animals, I guess, he wouldn't have made them out of meat. Uh, but it's all there, so go and get them if you guys want afterwards. We need to get that cleaned out because we've got more even coming this Thursday. They're picking it up on Christmas Eve. They've got another shipment coming in. So we need it gone. So after service, go and take what you can and what you'll use. And how are we doing, Sammy? Is it getting closer? Or is it still really, really warm? Really, really warm. We're going to have to just pour a bucket over you, all right? We'll just... <laughs> no. All right. Figure this out. Yeah, we could put the, we could put the hamburger in there. Thaw it out. We could do what? The turkey? We could do the turkey in there, too. Did you guys read the news article about people who thaw out turkeys in Florida by throwing them into the pool? Did you read that this year? They're thawing out their turkeys for Thanksgiving by throwing them in the swimming pool. That's traditionally how they thaw them out. They also twitched you know, the day after, but <laughs> they're fine. The interviews were kind of good. All right. How are we doing? <laughs> This is my wife says, please, please always have something to say. Never give him time just to come up with something. You know, my, my mom says I can, I can talk until I think of something to say. So it's a true statement. All right, we're getting closer. How you doing, Dave? It's gaining ground. Mark's coming again. Mark's got a bigger faucet. He's got a bigger water fountain back there. So we're going to try this again. This is, uh, for once... I just, I just want to, I just want to say this: that as service goes along today, it was not because of my sermon. All right. So for once, I am not taking the blame for this. I'm going to blame Keith for this one. All right. How are we doing? Getting better? We're getting better. Are we good? We'll try one more. No, no, we're good on water level. We're good. We're all right. Come on over here, Dave. Yep. Dump it in here. It's not going to hurt her. It's not too cold. It's not too cold. You think it's going to be too cold? All right. Goldie. Do you hear that? Is she Goldilocks? They're, they're making fun of me with the last name being Bear now. There we go. All right. It's just hurtful. I know. I'm so. For those who are online, I'm glad you can't hear all the comments that are being shared with me right now. Are we better? Yeah, okay. All right, well, it's going to work better if you're sitting down, dear. So go ahead and take a seat there. Sammy, this has been fun so far, but now it's a serious part, okay? Now it's a serious part because we talked about this. Baptism is such an important testimony of what Christ has done for you, and I'm proud of you for wanting to do this. I am. So, Sammy, at this moment, I want you to go ahead and hold your arms like I showed you there in the room, okay? Yep, there you go. So, Sammy, because of your testimony of salvation... And because of your faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing one more song up here, and then Sammy's going to, she's going to go back and change, she's going to come up here. And uh, after the song, this last song that we're going to sing, there's going to be a short little benediction. And after that benediction, we're going to turn the recording off because Sammy asked for a YouTube video that we can't play while live streaming because of copyright issues. But we as a church family can enjoy it together um, at the end of our service. So after the benediction, I'm going to do a short prayer so we can close the service out. But I want you guys to stay in your seats and just enjoy that last song with Sammy as well. So the worship team will come on up. I think we have another song for the worship team. They're going to come on up and lead us in one more hymn. And uh, we'll enjoy that together. Please rise. See you. 
do thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being part of this special time for Sammy and for celebrating with her as well. Um, when Sammy comes back in after this final song is played, we'll ask if you can just to go and greet her and just tell her congratulations and just mention that you're being praying for her as well. This is a big step, and it's one that's very important for all of us as we consider our own walk with God and obedience to Him. I hope you guys have a Merry Christmas. I know there's a lot of things going on. Hopefully we'll see some of you Christmas Eve. I know many of you have plans, can't be there, but I hope we'll see some of you there. And I do hope, if I don't say hi to you, that you will have a Merry Christmas this week. Do try to take a moment to remember the reason and to rejoice in this hope that we have, that even though things are weird right now, we really haven't lost anything because God's got a plan for us in the middle of this, and we can just celebrate that, that truth. And what a great thing that is. God, we praise you for being a good God. God, we do love you. We don't show that very much. We don't show that very well, I suppose. There are things in our lives that's obviously broken, but Lord, you, being a good God, have chosen to forgive us, and we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we just try to walk with you, like Sammy did today, taking the step of obedience. I pray that every day we would take a step of obedience out of our love for you. Help us with this, Lord. Continue to guide us. In Jesus' name. We pray.